Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first event of the spring quarter. Today, we have a special guest speaker and shout out to all the pre-PA students that we got a PA for you guys. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so before we do officially start with the content of the meeting, uh, we just want to do a quick reminder that uh, please remember to respect officers and guest speakers during the meeting. That includes uh, meeting yourself when the host is speaking or anybody else is speaking, using appropriate language in the call and chat. Uh, be sure to be polite. Um, and um, especially to those who work in like the health field, we'd ask that you avoid um, asking the guest speaker for any diagnostic questions. Um, I do have to say that unfortunately, if you do not follow these guidelines, uh, one of us, one of the officers are, is going to have to cast their wrath and remove you from the meeting. So we wanna avoid that. So please please be sure to follow the disclaimer, the rules. Sorry, this is so bad. Um, also, one more thing, the meeting is recorded and will be posted on the YouTube channel. So if you don't want to you know, hear your voice or if you don't wanna turn on your camera or anything, that's fine. And if you're not comfortable having your questions being asked during the meeting as well, um, just save your questions towards the end when we do stop the recording so you can privately ask. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you're participating in the attendance point system, remember that you need to sign out on the Google form at the end of the meeting. Uh, we'll put it in the chat with the word of the day. And then if you can't attend the meeting live, you will still have 24 hours um, to submit your point. And there are some extra credit opportunities. So uh, we sometimes we'll, we'll do Kahoot, and then you can also um, get extra credit by participating in community service, such as donating blood or volunteering. But today, I think we're skimming out on the Kahoot. Okay, and this is just a review of the upcoming events that we do have planned. Um, the first one, we do have a guest speaker, uh, but just to make sure we, we wanna confirm it before you know, promoting it. Um, that event is going to be on May 13th. Another one is going to be May 20th, where we do have a co collaboration with another club slash program on campus. So um, that is going to be on May 20th. And additionally, we'll have another guest speaker on May 27th who is an optometrist. Next slide, please. And we have an active opportunity spreadsheet um, that we update um, um, weekly or bi-weekly whenever we find opportunities. So if you want um, helpful opportunities such as virtual shadowing, pre-med resources, et cetera, then you could scan this QR code. I'll leave it in for like two seconds and yeah all right so here are our social medias and emailing list make sure to check them out for club updates and club events and it's really important that you guys join our emailing list because we send out all club opportunities and resources and events through email so yeah get connected with us and i also sent uh, all the moa links in the chat all right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you guys for the intro. Um, again, my name is Alec Larson. Um, I just finished um, actually PA school like maybe a week ago. So very fresh PA. Um, and I'm going to be taking my board's exam on May 11th. So I'm going to give you guys a little, let's see. Let me move this. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a little intro as far as like my background before PA school. Um, uh, talk a little bit about um, sort of what I did during that time in my gap year, um, some lessons I learned along the way, um, and then um, some tips for you guys just about applying to PA school, going into more what even is a PA, some of the prerequisites. Um, and then I'll talk about sort of uh, my day-to-day -day schedule um, as a PA student. And then feel free to ask me any questions that you guys have throughout. 
All right. So a little bit uh, about me, so you guys know um, who I am. Um, I'm originally from Santa Barbara. Um, pretty much uh, anything outdoors is my jam. Um, it kind of kept me sane during PA school, especially. Um, and I love finding like new breweries, um, finding food places. Um, it kind of sucked because like three months into my PA school, three to four months in just starting PA school is when COVID happened. And so it kind of shut everything down, but I managed to get a little bit of a taste for uh, Sacramento uh, before that happened. Um, and then I did my uh, PA program at um, University of the Pacific, um, which they have three campuses, which is kind of confusing, but the PA school is actually in Sacramento uh, versus their undergrad is in Stockton. And then they also have like a dental program that's in um, San Francisco. All right. So for my undergrad, um, I did it at uh, USC in Los Angeles. Um, I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Human Biology. Um, I finished in 2017. Um, I actually ended up staying an extra semester to sort of, uh, I guess, finish my major and also some of the prereqs for PA school. Um, and then I also took like my final prereq in 2018 um, at Santa Monica City College. I had like one more class I had to do. Um, so I did that after I finished the degree. Um, during undergrads, I was super involved in the intramurals. Um, I mainly did soccer, flag football. So I actually refed and I was um, sort of like supervisor for that. So just more, I guess, leadership experience I could put on my application. Um, and then I was pretty heavily involved in um, pre-PT, uh, physical therapy club, and then um, the pre-PA club, which I was just telling some of these guys before we started that I didn't even really know what a PA was until probably like my junior year of undergrad. Um, so I was pretty late to the game in, in that sense. Um, but uh, I still try to be involved at least those last couple of years that I was in school. All right. Um, so for my gap year, um, I pretty much got all my experience as an EMT. Um, I managed to jump right into USC's had like this accelerated EMT program. Um, so I kind of did that while I was taking that undergrad class that I mentioned in 2018. Um, I got into it mainly because my brother was working as one. Um, and so he kind of encouraged me to do it, even though I was completely terrified of just responding to medical emergencies because I had really no experience prior to that. Um, so I was like, let's just, I guess, full send and see what happens. So it worked out, um, requirements certs, uh, so you have to get a certification, um, uh, both nationally and then in the state that you work at, um, and the national cert requires you to take this like pretty quick exam, um, like at a testing center. And then the, the California cert, I think I just had to give them money and they gave me my cert. So pretty much the main stepping stone is that national cert. Um, and you have to take a, I think mine was only like three weeks, but I think most EMT things are like three to four months. They're like a semester long. So you have to finish the class and then it gives you authorization to take um, that national exam. Um, I found EMT opportunities, um, just in the LA area. Cause that happened to be where I did my training. Um, so one of the other things, if you guys don't know for EMT is you have to do a couple ride alongs, um, with like a paramedic or an EMT where you're in the ambulance, um, for like, you know, a full shift or a couple shifts. So I actually was able to, um, 
get a job with that company that I did my ride alongs, which you can see in the bottom left corner, um, which was McCormick ambulance, um, which is owned by AMR. If you guys have seen that around. Um, so that kind of worked out for me. I just sort of applied and they knew me already from that. Um, and then my main job as an EMT was, um, it varies depending on which county or system you work for. Um, I worked for LA County, um, which we were, we had the contract for all the 911 calls. Um, and so we would show up in the ambulance and then the fire department would show up as well. And um, the fire department would have their paramedics that were part of their crew. And so if a call was more serious that required a paramedic's assistance, then the paramedic would hop in the back with me and I would basically just assist them with starting an IV, starting fluids, um, taking vitals, um, hooking them up to the EKG, et cetera. Um, and then I also drove as well, um, which was kind of insane, just driving on the wrong side of the road and honking at people to get out of the way, basically. Um, lessons I learned from it. Um, I think the main one was that it sort of gave me, um, a little bit of encouragement and, um, solidified my passion for working in healthcare. Um, so I think, I think that was sort of the main thing is like, it made me realize that I could do it. Um, even though, as I mentioned to you guys prior, like I was super scared about going into it in the first place. Um, so it kind of gave me the confidence moving forward, um, you know, to going into PA school was like, if I can do that, then, you know, PA school shouldn't be too bad. Right. Um, and then some stuff from the gap year. Um, so I took, uh, I took a year of working and I was applying to PA school and then I actually didn't get in my first time to PA school. Um, I actually didn't get like any interviews at all. Um, so I think the biggest thing I learned was like, just don't really rush that process, which I felt like I did. Um, so I wish I had just taken a gap year and not necessarily really worried about PA school right off the bat. Um, definitely travel if you guys can. Um, and then the biggest thing is just not to study because <laughs> that's going to be most of what you're doing in PA school anyway. Um, so I would say if you are, if you do have the motivation to, I would study up on your guys' medical terminology. Um, but aside from that, you're going to get everything else in PA school. Um, and then last thing, I guess, just just know that whatever work experience you go into, it'll have some applicability in PA school. Um, I know some of my classmates, they were scribes before. Um, and so they were like wizards at the documentation portion of, P of being a PA. Whereas like that was my biggest weakness going in versus I had more of like the hands-on sort of skills. Um, so it's nice to have all those different people in your program that can sort of help you um, with your your gaps or weaknesses along the way. All right. Um, so I guess after all this chat, um, I guess what, what even is a PA? Um, basically, PAs are, um, I mean, you guys probably know this more than I do at this point, but PAs are basically medical professionals um, who operate very similar to a physician. Um, and so we are um, diagnosing, we're prescribing, um, we're laying out the treatment plan. Um, and a lot of times we really don't have that much um, interaction with an actual physician um, unless we have a case that we need to consult on. Um, but otherwise PAs are pretty much handling start to finish patient encounters. Um, so we're doing a lot on, in that front. Um, I mainly picked PA um, 
because I really wanted, I really wanted to be in that sort of doctor role. Um, but I knew I didn't want to go to med school. Um, and the other thing that stood out to me with PA is that you can change specialties. Um, whereas if you guys know when you go to med school, you have to choose a residency after you finish med school. And that's basically what you're locked into um, as your sort of specialty, unless you decide to go back to residency, but most of them are like three years. So people are pretty, pretty locked in. Whereas PAs, it's like, oh, cardiology sounds interesting. Okay, I'm gonna like apply for a cardio job. And then you get trained on the job to work in cardio. So you don't have to like go through that any residency to change specialties, which I liked. Um, and the other thing was, it just seemed like there was a great like work-life balance from the PAs versus MDs that I talked to. Um, that was a big thing that I knew that I have a really big priority about is I love medicine and I love, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to go into. Um, but I also know that I have other interests that I mentioned before, and I wanted sort of a balanced life versus I know some physicians and surgeons are just kind of all in to that, which, which is great if that's what you want to do. But I think it's important recognizing what you want for yourself um, when you're choosing career paths in medicine. Um, so I kind of talked about MD a little bit, and nurse practitioner, NP, um, very similar to PAs, um, they sort of get lumped together a lot of times as advanced practice providers. Um, but I would say that the training is very different between the two. Um, nurse practitioners are trained more on like the nursing model, like very holistic approach to the patient. Um, whereas PAs are trained primarily on the, the uh, MD or physician model. Um, as far as like just very rigidly doing physical exam and diagnosing and yada, yada, whereas nurse practitioners like are somewhat trained more like looking at the social aspects of medicine and that sort of stuff. Um, and then a lot of them have nursing backgrounds anyway, going into it. Um, so just a little different training, but um, nurse practitioners operate very similar to PAs um, as providers. Um, it's just, I don't think you can go into as many specialties as you can with um, PA. Um, excuse me. Um, so that's one thing to note. Like, there's not too many NPs, I don't think, in emergency medicine or surgery because um, they're very primary care oriented. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of them are in primary care. Not to say they're, they're definitely in other specialties as well. Um, and then nurse, I'm not too familiar with um, the nursing sort of background, um, but again, they're gonna be doing a lot of more of the assistance sort of work. So they're gonna be giving the medications that the PAs, NPs and doctors put in. Um, they're gonna be changing the bed sheets, um, dealing with more so the patients, um, so just a little different role, um, depending on what, what you want to do. Um, and then I guess I kind of already talked about scope for all of those. So like nurses, like can't prescribe, um, whereas NPs and MDs and PAs can, um, and then let's see requirements. So the prereqs vary a ton, um, depending on the school that you're applying to. Um, there's definitely a lot of crossover. Um, so they want, you know, like a lot of the main science courses. Um, I guess a personal anecdote, I didn't take, um, OCHEM and I was like towards the end of my, uh, undergrad. And I was like, I had these other classes and I was like, I, there's no way I'm taking OCHEM like at this point. So I just like looked for schools that didn't require OCHEM, um, which is not a ton, but there was, they're definitely out there. Um, and then sort of the amount of hours varies a lot too. Like some you'll see, oh, it requires like 500 hours to apply or like 250. Um, 
that's great, but I wouldn't go too much off those hours. I would personally try to shoot for like at least 1500 to 2000 before you guys apply. Um, one of my main issues the first time around when I applied, um, when I was working as EMT is I applied like right when I had a thousand hours. Um, and so I was at like the bare minimum for a lot of the programs. And I don't think they really liked that very much. Um, cause again, I didn't get any interviews my first time around. Um, but then when I upped it, I think when I applied again, I was like closer to 3000 and I got a lot more attention from the schools, um, that way. And like, my application overall didn't really change other than those hours. So just something to keep in mind. And then picking PA school, um, some factors to consider are location. Like I wanted to stay in California. Um, so I mostly applied to, to California schools. Um, pants, pass rates. Pants is like our board, our board's exam that we take at the end. Um, so there's like a pants pass rate for each program that you guys can look at. Um, I would say probably anything like above 90% is good. Um, other thing is, uh, let's see, I guess the main thing for me was actually on interview day um, at UOP. Um, I just felt like I really sort of vibed with the faculty there. Um, versus I didn't really get that feeling at some of the other schools I, I went and interviewed at. Um, so I think that's like something to consider even down the line when you guys actually do get interviews is sort of feeling out like, can I see myself here with the, these faculty? Um, that's a big part of it. Um, and then, so it's kind of confusing, but there's a bunch of different terms that also go after each PA program. Um, so for instance, when I started at UOP, it was, it had um, provisional status, which basically means that they have not graduated five consecutive classes yet. Um, and so UOP was a newer program. Um, so actually my year was our fifth class. Um, and then the ARC PA, which is like the governing body for PAs, they hold all the programs to a certain standard. Um, and so if your school maintains those standards after five years, then your school goes into um, like full accreditation. Um, and then that usually lasts for like 10 plus years. Um, the biggest thing you guys want to make sure when you're applying is try to potentially avoid schools that are on probation um, because that means that they didn't fulfill one of those um, requirements for the RPA. Um, it's not a big deal, but just note that whatever you, whatever accreditation you go into your program as, um, that will be like your status um, when you come out of PA school. And so if you go into a program that's provisional like I did, it was still accredited. And so even let's say like the program fell apart um, after I left, I would still be able to sit for my board's exam. Um, so it's just whatever you go into the program as is the biggest um, deal for you. I just realized, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat at all, but Okay, because there's no questions. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the accreditation. If you guys have any other questions about that, let me know. It's, it's kind of confusing um, for sure. But just make sure the program's accredited before you fully commit. Um, and then does it matter which PA school? Not really. Um, a lot of the PAs that I talked to before I got into school was just like get in somewhere um, and don't get too bogged down and like, having to stay in California or um, some of the other stuff. Like you're going to get this very similar education wherever you go because of that standard. Um, and then you can always come back to wherever you want to work as a PA, um, but you'll get that national cert uh, or national licensure essentially. So 
it's not a big deal where you go. Um, and then let's see. Um, tips. Um, I would say, so for the healthcare experience hours, um, I did some volunteering for that. And then I also um, worked with this kid who had muscular dystrophy. Um, so I would say just try to find some sort of like healthcare related thing that you can do on the side. I don't think healthcare experience is super important. I think they care more about the paid, the PCE hours. Um, so don't worry too much about the, the healthcare ones, but the paid one, the PCE hours are probably the most, one of the most important things on the application. Um, and I'm a little bit dated on what PA programs accept now. Like, I don't really know if they accept, um, what is it like scribing anymore or something? Um, but I would just find like something on there that will give you like some sort of background in healthcare. Um, uh, so if you, if you can do scribing, that's great. If you want to do EMT, that's great. Um, medical assistant is fine too. Just something that gets you hours towards it. Um, let's see. Oh, question. Examples of ways to get PC hours. Um, so yeah, again, I guess that would just be in one of those categories of um, like anything that's a paid healthcare job. Um, and a lot of those are just going to be like sort of the, uh, you know, the starting jobs that you can get in healthcare, like just an EMT basic, um, stuff like that. So I guess it's hard to say like ways to get it other than that. Um, but it just has to be like paid hours where you're having some sort of patient, um, contact. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, and then GRE, uh, I took the GRE, but I got a pretty poor score on it. Um, so I didn't even include it in my applications. Um, and I just applied to schools that didn't require it. Um, and I'm not too familiar with the PCAT, but I remember they were talking about that when I was applying, like implementing it. So um, I don't know if you guys have more info on that, but I know some schools, I think, accept it now, but again, I'm, I'm probably not the person to ask about the PCAT stuff. Um, letter of recs, super important. Um, I didn't read it, read some of the applications super thoroughly on my first time through. Um, so some of the schools actually want you to get a, a PA um, letter of rec, which Again, I didn't have my first time around applying. So I think that was my other downfall when I applied. Um, so if you can try to get a PA to write you a letter of rec, and then just usually um, you have to get like some academic letter of rec from like a professor. Um, and then one from, I think, job experience or something. So um, I just had one of my... Um, uh, paramedics that I worked with, he just wrote me a, a letter of rec for that. Okay. And then last thing, the schedule. Um, so we did my program, it's a little different depending on which program you go to, but mine, um, so that you start out in the classroom, which is um, ours was about a year and three months of like classroom stuff. Um, and so we would basically be like Monday through Friday, eight to four or five with like a hour lunch break. Um, we would just be in the classroom like the whole, basically the whole entirety of that time. Um, we started out with some of the basic like refresher courses of anatomy physio um, and then some other like um, PA related classes that they require. Um, and then my second and third semester, 
uh, was getting more in like the clinical medicine um, aspects of actually learning about, um, you know, different disease processes and how to diagnose and what tests to order, et cetera. Um, but same schedule, like even after COVID, it was basically just on Zoom though, from like eight to five or eight to four every day, uh, Monday through Friday. And then we would have basically exams every single week on the Monday. Um, so that was pretty much the, the most of it. And then um, the amount of time dedicated to studying, um, it really varied. Um, it was pretty hard to motivate myself sometimes, like after being in the class all day and then studying, but it's kind of like the expectation that they, they want you to study for at least like a couple hours after that. So um, I would usually try to try to do that. Um, sorry, Julie, did you have a, a question? I just saw your hand go up. Yeah, um, you said you struggled a little bit with like finding the motivation to study. Um, like having been through today's um, nearly graduation now, have you developed like any strategies or like, do you have an improved study method? I know there's like, the Pomodoro method and like so many different strategies. Do you have any to share? Um, I think overall it, it's kind of, it'll vary just depending on what you find effective. But as far as for me, um, I have a pretty short attention span. And so um, I can only like study for about 40 minutes straight before I like start clicking on other things or ordering something on Amazon or whatever. Um, so I would do like these 40 minute blocks, like where I would set a timer, I would put my phone in airplane mode. Um, I would set my timer for like 40 minutes. And then I would just go like super hard for 40 minutes of studying. Um, and then after that was done, um, I would stop it and I would take like a 10, 15 minute break that was also timed. Um, and I would stick to both like very religiously. So like when the 40 minutes was done, I would like stop what I was doing. And then I would take my 15 minutes of like walking outside or doing whatever. And then once the 15 minutes was over, like same thing, I would just get back into the 40 minutes straight. Um, so I would try to like respect both of those time frames really well. Um, I think on my like peak productive days, I would maybe do that. Uh, well, it just, it varied, I guess, but peak productive, I would usually try to get like four or five of those cycles in. Um, but like after, after like all day of lecture, I would maybe only be able to do like two of those cycles. Cause I would like eat dinner and then I would like go through two of those. And then like, that was it. Like it would be like diminishing returns at that point where I just like would be reading the same sentence like four times over. So I wasn't, I was like wasting time. Um, but then on my days off, like on some weekends, it would be, it could be like five, six, seven of those cycles, like depending on how, you know, if we had like tests the next day or whatever. Um, uh, and I think one other thing that really helped me with um, like not burning out was making sure that I did take some weekends off to like go and do whatever, like some of the pictures I included earlier, like were from a Yosemite trip that I took with some classmates. So we just like sent it on a weekend and went to Yosemite. We like went camping another weekend. So um, I would say like, looking back, I really appreciated those times too, because it kind of gives you like a reset and like gives your brain a break actually. And I think it was more important than me just like studying all day on those days um because i would came back and i was like okay i'm i feel a little more like recharged and ready um and then i guess the last thing i forgot to mention so after the year of uh classroom stuff um that was when we started clinical rotations um and so that was a year straight of rotating at different sites and specialties um, every month. So my school, we do 
um, 12 clinical rotations. We had one online rotation, like learning about um, business and like legal aspects of being a PA. Um, and then the other 11 were all like, um, you know, pediatrics, women's health. Um, we had two elective rotations, which I did both of those in the emergency department um, for mine. Um, so actually, no, I lied. I did one emergency department and then one cardio rotation for mine. Um, and then after that, you are pretty much done. Um, like we had some final like testing and stuff like that, but that's like the second half of PA school is basically like working full time um, as like a PA. Uh, and then you have like a preceptor who's either like a PA or a doctor. Um, let's see. Um, are there even weekends in PA school? I mean, not really <laughs> in that, in the classroom portion, not really, but um, we try to take advantage of like ones we could. Uh, but during the clinical year, when you're working, you have like way more of a life, which is super nice. Um, like my cardio rotation was only three days a week and it was beautiful. Like I had all those days to attempt to study and live my life. So um, what was the biggest adjustment uh, from undergrad to PA school? Uh, I think just like the sheer amount of information that they throw at you. Um, I think it's kind of cliche because I hear like everybody say it, but like the fire hose analogy is very accurate uh, when it comes to information. Like we learned like all of women's health in like a week. Um, so just, I don't know, stuff like that. Like you just, you're learning like entire body systems and entire like disease processes and how to like diagnose and treat in like a week is just nuts. Like it's not really possible, but, um, so I think that was, I think that was my biggest adjustment from undergrad where I felt like I had a little bit more room to like breathe with like assignments and tests and stuff. Um, yeah, it was just like the sheer amount of information and stuff to do, but again, like it, it just, it's not really something that you can prepare for until you're actually in it. And then you just like adjust to it. Like you figure out what works. Like there's not really, it's not really like something to even stress over. It's just like something that when you're in that environment, you just get more used to it. Um, which exam do you recommend GRE or PCAT? Um, I mean, I would say neither if the programs don't require either of them. <laughs> But I'm again, I'm like, I'm not really the, the person for that to ask because I like bombed the GRE. So I, I don't know. I don't really get that test. Like the GRE is so dumb to me. Like it doesn't even, it doesn't even really test your, your like clinical ability in any way of like, if you're going to be a good PA or not, like that's what I don't get it. Yeah, exactly. It's the, the standardized testing is just the dumbest thing to me, but I guess they have to have some. So, I mean, maybe the PCAT does that. I don't know. That's, I'm not too familiar again with the PCAT. So maybe that's why it's a little bit better. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm glad I'm not alone with that one. But just know you guys can become a PA uh, without those skills. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, and then I guess the mental health aspect kind of already touched on that a little bit um, with like just making sure that you guys take some time to yourself um, and family and friends if you can um, and just having stuff on the side that you enjoy doing because um, I think that was really easy to lose in PA school. Um, like you just sort of, I feel like now like coming out of it, it's a little weird because I'm like, I know a lot about medicine stuff, but I stopped doing some of the stuff that I like doing. So I'm like trying to get back into that now, which is weird. And I like, don't even know how to have a conversation anymore unless it involves medicine, but that's just me. Yeah, you can play, 
you could do whatever honestly play some video games just something to like get your mind off of um medicine is super important and then let's see uh so some final tips for you guys um uh i would say apply early if you can just because um uh, some of the programs are on like rolling admissions. So they'll just like look at your application when it comes in. Um, so that's nice. Um, and for the personal statement, um, for sure, just like find some theme that really fits with um, who you are as a person. Uh, because again, this is like their main opportunity to see sort of or get a visual of who you are before they actually meet you in person. Um, so if you can somehow paint that picture for them, um, whether that's like, for instance, on mine, I just, I told um, a couple clinical experience stories that I had as an EMT, um, like working with some tricky patients um, and then just sort of like morphing that back into like why medicine is for me. So if you can just find like some sort of theme like that, um, that'll give them a, a better idea of who you are, I think is the most important. Um, and then, yeah, don't, don't freak out if you don't get in the first time. Um, it's really common for people to apply like two, three times before they get into PA school. Um, and contrary to medical school, a lot of PA schools um, really like that if you've applied before, um, just because it shows that you're dedicated to going for it and um you know it's just part of the part of the process like a lot of people don't get in on their first time so don't don't freak out about it just keep trying to accrue hours and figure out how you can make your application stronger for the next time um would i say pa school is as competitive or even more to medical um I don't really know how it is now, but um, I would say it's probably as or maybe more in some cases competitive than med school. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure, but I would say they're probably equally like very, just very competitive. Like everyone's, everyone's trying to get on the PA school uh, train just because it's, it makes sense more so than dedicating like half your life to medical school if you want to go into medicine so um yeah i think they're just i think they're equally as competitive um for sure but the thing with pa schools is there's typically not as much um space in each of the classes so like my class is like 45 people um and i know like davis's is a little bigger it's like 90 but then you have like medical schools that are like 300 people so I think that's something to um, factor in. Excuse me. Um, UOP got about 4,000, 4 to 5,000, something like that, 4 to 5,000 applications for 45 seats. So it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of insane. Um, yeah, but again, like, a lot of those applications, though, from what I heard, are just like thrown out. Uh, oh, for, 45. Yeah, not not four to five people. No, yeah, 45 people. Um, yeah, a lot of those applications, though, are like immediately thrown out um, because people don't don't have um, like some basic requirement, like like they didn't read something like me. And so they won't even like bother looking at your application. Um, at that point. Um, yeah, it's kind of insane, honestly, but that's why I recommend like applying to maybe like 10 schools, like maybe 10 to 15. I don't know. You can do more if you want, but I just, I didn't have the, the patience, um, to like sit there and do all those applications for that many schools. So I think I did like nine to 10. Yeah. Yeah. And it also is kind of expensive for sure. Um, yeah. Other thing I'll say is um, it's super hard with social media now, but like if you can help it, just try not to compare yourself um, 
to other people that are going to PA school or that like post their, you know, acceptance thing. Um, Cause again, everyone's just on a different sort of part of the, I guess, PA school journey, if you want to call it. Um, so it's easy to like, look at someone else and be like, damn, like, why didn't I get in this cycle and that person did or whatever, but just try to, again, like ground yourself a little bit and realize that, um, it's just, it is kind of a grind to get into PA school and it takes time and it takes a lot of years sometimes of pushing towards that. Um, but if it's ultimately something that you really want to do, it'll, it'll work out for you guys. Um, so again, just try not to like look at other people and be like, damn, they're, they're doing what I want. Just try to, you know, bolster your application and keep going. Um, oh yeah. So I learned this from that first app, first time applying is all of my basic information, um, got carried over, which was actually kind of, uh, like the silver lining of doing that rushed application the first year. Um, so like most of the stuff, when I applied my second time around, um, I didn't have to like fill out a lot of the basic stuff, which is time consuming. Um, so that was nice, uh, just to know if you guys apply, you know, a couple of times, um, you will have to, re to resubmit your letter of recs though, to your people. Um, and then last thing again, don't rush the process like I did. Um, so take some time, get those, get like, I would say 1500 hours at least maybe before you apply your first time. Um, uh, I mean, you, you can, if you feel like it, you can try to apply at like a minimum amount, but, um, again, I think schools really care a lot about the patient care hours. So, um, research the school requirements. Um, I was talking a little bit uh, to the leadership team earlier about it, but like I tried to do a Excel spreadsheet with them, but it was like super sloppy and it didn't really help me. Um, so I kind of just like would go through the schools and I would like figure out, okay, I, I know I can apply to this one because I have all of those requirements or whatever. So I would like write down the school, but I didn't necessarily like go through like, okay, I have the microbiome and all that stuff. Um, I would just like do a completionist sort of take on it. Like I have, I have everything I need to apply to this school. So I'm going to apply there. Um, if you can try to shadow different um, providers in um, different positions. Um, it might sound a little bit weird, but I think it actually will help um, in the long run, if you can somehow like shadow a doctor and a PA or like a PA and a nurse practitioner, because from the admissions standpoint, um, it shows that you're a little more well-rounded and you know, for a fact that you want to do PA versus one of the other, um, healthcare professions. So I think it gives them an idea like, okay, this person saw the multiple routes you can go in healthcare and they still want to do the PA route. Um, so I think it just looks better. Um, do I have any tips on how to reach out to shadowing? Yeah, this was like, this was the bane of my existence. Um, when I was applying to PA school or trying to get in, um, I was fortunate enough to meet a couple PAs um, when I was working as EMT in Los Angeles uh, because I would just take patients to them constantly in the emergency department. Um, and after I like would saw them for a couple months, I just asked one of them if I could shadow. Um, so if you can somehow like just get any sort of connection with like a PA, whether it's like even maybe the doctor's office you go to or like a friend of a friend, um, just try to somehow get those connections, but it's really hard. Like I, I didn't have any success with cold emailing or calling. Um, so I would say if, maybe if you could even like walk into an office and tell them like your situation that you're trying to get into PA. Um, I think a lot of providers will completely understand like, um, 
I know that'll be something I'm going to try to prioritize with students too, is like, I just, like everyone had to go through it. So everyone knows it's like just a pain. Um, and I'm actually, so I am going to be starting in the emergency department um, in August of this year. Um, so it'll be actually, it'll be at um, one of the rotation sites that I went through on my clinical year. Um, I just, I really liked them and they thought I was good, I guess. So they offered me a job there, which was pretty common actually for um, a lot of sites or a lot of my, my classmates as well. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So you just gotta, I guess you just gotta injure your toe and then you can get some shadowing experience that way. Exactly. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually, I didn't really know what I wanted to go into. Um, I knew like my background is in ER, so I liked it a lot, but I left it very open on my rotations. Um, surgery was, was super cool. Like there's nothing like being in the, the operating room, like nothing even comes close to it. Um, as far as just being super cool, but you just don't get to practice a lot of medicine as a PA in the operating room. Um, you're basically the first assist on the surgeon. So you're like directly across from them on the operating table. And you're pretty much just like re holding retractors and suctioning. Um, and then the most exciting part of what PAs get to do is like, you get to suture up like the big incision sites after the surgeon's done. But aside from that, like you're not necessarily really practicing like full on medicine. Um, but yeah, I was between that and ER, but uh, everyone was telling me to go into ER first because it's very um, broad specialty to start out in. Uh, I actually, I, I still haven't downloaded TikTok, so I'm not too familiar with that, but they definitely like blasted music in the operating room. Like some of the, some of the surgeons would play like, like rap and I don't know, it was pretty awesome. I actually, I am a millennial. I'm, I'm only 27, but I still have refused to download TikTok. So. Um, yeah, surgery, surgery is awesome. Like you can make some good money in surgery too. Don't join it. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see what else. Um, yeah. Last thing was, um, just on your application, I guess, just try to be as well-rounded as possible. So you don't have to be like a thousand percent in all medicine stuff at all times. Like they really want to make sure that you're actually a human and that you can have a conversation with people um, and that you have other interests outside of PA school. Um, so if you guys do like any sort of volunteer stuff or help out with like, I don't know, like a food drive or something like put that on your application because they just like people that are involved in their community and people that are active and um, like to do stuff. So I just noticed that at least like my whole cohort, like everyone in my class or most people in my class were just very like, just out, you know, for the most part, like outgoing and they all had like, everyone had their own little interests and stuff. So yeah, I volunteered, um, what did I do with my volunteer stuff? I volunteered at like a hospital in downtown LA. Um, I worked with that kid that had muscular dystrophy, as I said. Um, and then I'm kind of blanking on some of the other stuff. Honestly, it was, oh, I worked at like, a, what did I do? I think I like helped out with some, um, like some events like at USC that were just like not medical related, like if there was concerts and stuff. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, and then I worked at like a clinic, like an underserved clinic in San Diego as well. Um, yeah, it's honestly, it's pre-med or like STEM stuff is, is pretty intense. So I don't blame you for not having hobbies. It's really hard. <laughs> um, did I have the chance to do research in PA school? Uh, yes, because um, all of the, I think it's a national standard, but uh, everyone basically has to do like a master's thesis. Um, and so I guess it wasn't like traditional like research. So I wasn't, I wasn't like on the front lines doing that sort of research, but we had to like write this like capstone project that was um, basically a research project that we were like sort of testing the boundaries of whatever our topic was. So mine was looking into um, using metformin in pre-diabetes patients. So um, if you guys don't know, like metformin is the first drug that we put all of our diabetic patients on. Um, and so you could basically pick whatever topic was interesting, but it sort of had to be a topic that's like still in the works of figuring out for clinical practice. So that was like our main, I guess, research that we had to do in PA school. Um, I, I, yeah, I honestly don't quote me on all PA schools requiring it, but I think most require some sort of um, like master's researchy sort of assignment thing, but we were like working on it for basically like a year and a half. So it's not like something that is like overnight, like that you like chip away at it. Um, cause that, that's not really, not really something I'm super into, but, um, uh, yeah, they, they did a good job at, at spacing it out, um, appropriately. Um, and let's see, oh, shoot. I don't know if you guys have any other questions or anything else, but I think that was pretty much all my wisdom I could offer. Um, trying to think of anything else. But yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, if you guys have any more questions, I'll stick around. If you guys have questions, just drop it in the chat. Um, I don't know, Julie, if you want me to leave this or you or I. Yeah, you can leave it. Okay. Or well, if anybody has questions, like drop in the chat because I didn't want to interrupt you during your presentation. So I just like wrote it on the side. Oh, no, that was perfect. Yeah, no, that was good. Okay. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first question I have, I think because college applications is just so relevant now, and especially with like transfers, GPA is a really big component to it. And I'm just wondering for like grad school and PA school, how relevant is having a pretty high GPA? Like how important of a factor is it? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely, I think it's definitely important. Um, but again, I don't think that it's like the end all be all um, for getting into PA school. Um, I know, I, I don't really know the, the requirements now, but I think when I applied, it was like, you have to have like a minimum of like a 3.0 or something. I don't know if that's the same, but anyway, I would say the higher, the better, but I know some people that were like on the lower end of that and they still got into PA school. Um, I just think that you, if you do have a lower GPA, I think you have to kind of bolster it with some other component within your application. Um, so like more volunteering hours, more patient care hours, um, uh, or like, I don't know, some leadership experience or something like that. So like something else, but again, a lot of the PA schools, as I said, are just looking for like a very well-rounded person. Um, and someone that has a 4.0 GPA doesn't mean they're going to be a good PA. Um, if they can't do a proper physical exam and, and calm someone down in the emergency department or whatever, you know, like you have to be able to talk to people and the, 
the admissions committee fully understand that. And so they're not going to really hold, hold that fully against you and like not give you a chance um, if you're on the lower end of that. I hope okay. that answers your question. Yeah, just like curious, like what is a competitive one though? Like how low is, actually I've seen, I'm on like the Facebook group and some, some people are like 3.3s or 3.4s, but they're like making it in. So I guess it varies a lot. It does, yeah. Um, and that's why it makes it really hard again to like compare yourself to those people um, because you just don't know any of their other statistics. So like they could have like 4,000 or 5,000 work experience hours, you know? Um, so it just depends. But yeah, again, I wouldn't like, I don't know if you guys want me to throw out a number, like maybe try to be like above a 3.2 or something. I don't know. Yeah. It, again, it's, it's so variable. It's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Com yeah. But competitive wise, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the school websites, I think like, don't they post like the average GPA or something of their applicants? I think they I've could. seen that. So that's a good point. So, yeah. Um, but again, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't see that and like freak out if it's like, you know, a three, seven or something like I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that discourage you. Um, Cause there's going to be people like all over, like some people with like 3.9s or whatever. And then some with like 3.4s or 3.3s. So it's really variable. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Julie asks, did you ever have moments of self-doubt during PA school if you truly wanted to be a PA? Um, I don't know if I really actually ever doubted that I wanted to be a PA. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't really think of like a significant moment, but I definitely had moments where I was like, shit, can I, like, can I finish this program? You know, like, I think everyone has sort of those moments like, just in anything in life. Like when you're presented with something really difficult, it's like, you have some self-doubt about like, how did I get into the program? Like, should I be here? I don't know. I guess like imposter syndrome is what they call it. Um, so I think it was more so that like, I just was always questioning myself um, or, you know, occasionally like, am I meant to be here, I guess, but not really. Like I kind of knew that I was pretty set on becoming a PA um, and like filling that role. Uh, okay. Thank you for answering that. Mm -hmm. I felt that on a level. <laughs> um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I believe Iman, sorry, I butchered your name, asked like, oh, she asked how high should a GPA be at a minimum, which is probably competitive is like at least a 3.2, I believe is what he said. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, answered. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, of no course. Worries. Yeah, and that'll just be depending on like the, like something that it will have on the school website too, like the minimum on that. Uh, Chloe asks, is making friends in PA school scary? Would you say friendships benefit your journey as a PA? Because she's kind of anxious to meet new people and maintain social interactions as an adult. That's a good question. Um, I didn't, I don't think it was um, really intimidating for me, um, just because I think going in, like everyone, everyone wants to be there. Um, and everyone's sort of coming in with not really like a full expectation of like what they got themselves into, I guess. Um, and so I think like that sort of brings everyone together on like a certain level of bond. Like I think within PA school, I had a pretty close group of like maybe five to 10 of us. Um, but then there was like the other 30 people that I like knew really well. Um, but weren't necessarily like my close, close friends. Um, but I think just everyone in the cohort, like had that sort of bond, like we're all in this together, like we're all in the trenches. Um, and so I didn't really feel like intimidated or scared by that. Um, and there was no, there's not really any like competition at all. Like everyone was very supportive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like 
everyone comes in with completely different backgrounds. Um, and so I think it was finding the, your strengths and weaknesses, um, and getting people that sort of can help you with those was really nice during PA school. Um, so I think it definitely benefits you, um, to like, at least have some friendship, uh, because again, like it's, it's a really challenging Porsche part of your life. Um, and so having the people that can fully understand what you're going through, um, it just helps a ton. Like even like family and friends, like they're never going to be able to know what PA school truly is right. Until like, unless they've actually done it. So having those outside people was amazing. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I hope that answers that one. Thank you. Julie asks, how do you avoid being in the toxic mindset of comparing yourself to others? I, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I think like, I think if, if you really, if you really find yourself um, in a situation where it's like actually causing you anxiety uh, or just like stress in your life, I would say maybe just take a break from social media. Um, yeah, I think that's like the, I think that's maybe just cutting the head off the snake. If you can just like get yourself off of social media for a bit. Um, that's like the root of it, right? Is that when you, when you see like people post about their PA school applications or whatever, um, it just always like induces some sort of anxiety when you see that. And like, yeah. And there's, I think it's human nature too to compare ourselves to to people in our circle, right? Um, like even rich people do that. They're like, damn, that guy has like two boats and I only have like one. Like, what? Now I need to buy like a second one. So I think it's just like universal across all of humanity to do that. So if you can find supportive people in your life um and take a break from social media, I think hopefully that helps get out of the toxic mindset a little bit. Thinking backing on that question, um, even though like, even though I'm currently in university, I still kind of feel like rushed to become like a PA because like, um, especially with the social medias, I see like friends my age, like um, they're entering like nursing school now and they're like wearing mm -hmm. scrubs and everything. And I'm still trying to grind out undergrad. And after that, like, a gap year is probably going to be needed to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, get those PCEs. So like, I'm just wondering, like, was the age distribution in your class pretty spread? Like average age, like how you avoid feeling stress, like stressed and rushed as well? Because it's very, we live in a very fast, especially California, it's like very fast paced and like mm -hmm. you're expected to, you know, keep up, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. Um, I guess the first part of that was the age distribution. I think the average age in my class, I think was 27. Um, I think going into the program, I think that's what it was. Um, so we had some people that, uh, as I briefly mentioned, like they did their patient care hours, like during undergrad, um, what so they were able to like apply almost immediately out of undergrad which that was just not that was not where I was at in my life um which was great for them but that wasn't me so they were like coming into the program at like 23 or something but then we had other people who actually um this was like their second or third career um so we had like one guy who was a uh he was one of my, my good friends. Um, he was a medical device rep or something like before PA school. And he was just like not fulfilled at all. He was like, the money was amazing, but he was like, I just get home and I like, don't feel fulfilled with like my life and like what I'm doing. And so he just completely like changed career paths, like in his mid to like late thirties. Um, so there was those people. And then there was a few people who were like in their forties who like had kids and a wife and were just, I don't know, like full sent it and went to PA school. So it was very variable, but again, I would say the majority were like around like mid to late twenties, um, 
of people, but yeah, there's people on both sides of the, um, of the age scale. Um, and then I've like, how many, like how many years would you say if you were to take a gap year and you're starting from scratch is one year, would you say is like sufficient if you work like a typical, like eight to five, or it's probably going to be two years like to get those amount of hours? Yeah, I would say probably, I don't know what that really calculates out to, but I think 40 hours a week for a year probably wouldn't be, yeah, I don't know how much that would be, but you'd probably end up having to do like two years because my EMT job was like 24 hour shifts. Um, so that hours kind of accrued a little bit more in that sense. Um, but yeah, I would say like realistically at least a year of like, um, a gap year. Um, mm. and then just like play it by ear, like looking at your hours and assessing, um, where you're at from there. Mm. Um, yeah. If anybody else has questions, like drop it. Um, one last for me, <laughs> cause I'm waiting. Yeah, no worries. Uh, did any of your prereqs expire? Uh, no. No? I don't think so. Um, Perfect. yeah. Cause I, um, as I said, like I was so late to the PA hype train, um, in undergrad that thankfully, like the, I was already going down like the physical therapy route. Um, and so I kind of already had like a decent amount of the prereqs already done. Um, but yeah, so I, I had to like switch a little bit though. And then I had to take the microbiology um, class after the fact um, at like a community college. So um, yeah. it's kind of blessing in disguise that you found it late then because all your prereqs made it on time, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it kind of was. Yeah. But I think, I think most of them last for like five years, maybe. Does that sound right? It does, or, but like I heard mixed messages. It's like some people said it expires the day you graduate, and others say it expires once you take that class, like starting after you're finished with that class. So it's kind of like confusing. the day you graduate. Yeah, that's what they said to me, and I was like, hmm, "That's interesting." Yeah, um, that's that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, um, me neither. So like you would finish you'd like finish your undergrad and you'd basically like have to have applied to PA school already then or like yeah, retake like, it or something. If you like say you graduated this year, then five years from now, like your, your anatomy and physio class that you took in freshman year, like. Oh, I see. I see. When you graduate. And oh, yeah. I said, that's very interesting. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that's accurate, but that's what someone who was applying told me. And I said, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's, I, yeah, I guess I never really thought about, that, but um, that's, I'm sorry, I don't know too much about that, but that's crazy though. If that's the no, case, yeah. like, it's like, what, you want me to like retake a class that I took freshman year? Like, that doesn't make any sense, but. Yeah, I don't know, but I'll do, that's, that's a problem for later. <laughs> um, yeah. Julie asked, if you weren't down the PA health route, what do you think you would be doing like right now? Um, wow, that's a good question, actually. I honestly, I don't really even know. Um, I mean, I was like, before I was like gung ho about anything health, um, like I went into undergrad as a computer science major. Um, so it was like vastly different. And I wanted to do like, I wanted to do like video game design stuff. Um, and then I realized like I would kind of go crazy if I was just like coding all day and like not being able to talk to people. So I was like, healthcare sounds like something I could talk to people. So kind of got me into it, but probably that, or I've always had this like weird dream of like, like a DJ. I feel like it'd be super fun. Um, so maybe like one of the two like either video game or being a DJ. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll, yeah, that'll be my, <laughs> that'll be my, my side gig. I'll like moonlight DJing. 
that would be pretty fun actually i'll probably i'll probably just mess around with mess around with dj stuff like in my free time yeah yeah in the morning you could like do your pa job until five and then at night you're a dj yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> you'll see one of your patients wait i don't know anyways um... that would be awesome that's a good question <laughs> Wait, was Calvin, was Calvin Harris, uh, did he have some like other job before that, before being a DJ or, oh, he was a PA. (laughs) (laughs) That would be amazing if he was, that would be like my full inspiration then to do that. Okay. I think we can start wrapping up. Um, if anybody else has questions, <laughs> That's um, awesome. I think so. Let's take a picture really quick. Um, Alec, if you could stop sharing the screen, um, oh, I'll yeah. take a quick screenshot, and then soon we'll send out the sign out form for everybody to sign out and get your points. Um, hi, hi, Johnny. Camera on if you're comfortable. Yeah, turn your camera on if you're comfortable. So I, I'm going to go ahead and take a picture. Um, hello. Hi. Thanks for turning your camera on. Good to see your face. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, let me just full screen this really quick. Oh, you're driving? OK, it's better for you not to turn your camera on. That's really safe. OK, I'll take it. And three, two, one, cheese. Okay, I'll take another one just in case if you want to do a different pose or whatever. I see, see. <laughs> one, two, three. Perfect. Okay. Um, if somebody could share like the word of the day, the sign out sheet should be in the chat. But other than that, I believe that concludes our meeting. And once again, Alec, thank you so much for give me such an amazing like presentation. I learned a lot personally and I'm sure many did based off the bright smiles that Iman has. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank no you worries. so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you guys for having me. I'll, um, I'll throw my email in the chat if you guys have any questions that come up later or um, whatever, just let me know.